Whether you're in the heart of downtown or on the quiet country roads, the physical landscape of Schenectady County is defined by remnants of and monuments to the past. Few places in New York State have their history as well preserved as Schenectady does. But while we can be proud of this fact, we should never imagine that the buildings and markers on display today account for the lived perspectives of all Schenectadians equally. In fact, there are a variety of ways in which our traditional historic records privilege the stories of certain groups over others. Today, we'll be exploring just one dimension of this problem, specifically how it applies to Schenectadians of color. While the first black Schenectadians were brought here in the 17th century, there is very little physical evidence to attest to their presence. Of the many historical markers affixed to Schenectady properties, only two relate to its historic black community. There's this sign at the former site of the African Methodist Zion Church, and there's also this little sign denoting the home of Simon Speck, an 18th century free black man. But beyond that, nothing for more than three and a half centuries worth of people. Indeed, it would not be unreasonable to feel like Schenectady's black history has been somehow erased. At the Schenectady County Historical Society, we're acutely aware of this issue, and we can't help but be embarrassed to note that our own collections and library reflects this larger problem. Our archive began as an attempt to preserve the history of the Dutch and English families that dominated society in the 17th and 18th century. And while we've long since broadened the focus of our archives, the surviving documentary record strongly favors the wealthier, more visible, and powerful segments of society. As far as the colonial period is concerned, people of color are only really documented in various deeds of sale, receipt, and incidental anecdotes. Of course, this is also a period in which the overwhelming majority of these black Schenectadians were enslaved, a status that left them uniquely unable to leave behind a historical record of their own. But in 1827, as New York State abolished slavery and black New Yorkers were theoretically free to create their own histories, even then they become somehow more obscure. As educators, we've struggled with our own ignorance of this crucial moment, as hundreds of Schenectadians gained their freedom and made new lives for themselves. Indeed, it's not an overstatement to say that the black experience in Schenectady through the whole 19th century is largely a mystery to us. In an effort to rectify this, the SCHS has had to look outside its own collections. One project we recently undertook was to look at federal census data to see what it could teach us. What started as a curious impulse turned into a massive undertaking as we began to comb through literally thousands of pages looking for the people who don't appear in our traditional records. We began to record what information we could and at the end of an exhaustive process we've compiled spreadsheets for each decade from 1790 to 1910. We do believe we've been able to identify every single person of color who appeared in the Schenectady census during this time. Of course, census data is not perfect. Census takers will make errors, and the records themselves can deteriorate. In one dramatic example, the 1890 census was burned in a catastrophic fire, and we have essentially no data from that year. But this project has given us an immense amount of raw demographic information that we hope will facilitate future research. We've begun to digest some of this data ourselves, and in this video, we'd like to share what we've learned so far. As you may expect, federal census data provides us first and foremost with the population of Black Schenectady. This graph illustrates this most basic of statistics across the whole of Schenectady County for the whole century. If we begin in 1790 with our first reliable data from the first federal census, we see 464 enslaved and 35 free black people, for a total just under 500. For the following three decades, that population stayed relatively stable, and perhaps we shouldn't be surprised by this. After all, slavery was still legal throughout this period, only coming to a final end in 1827. 
One of the obvious consequences of being enslaved is being unable to come and go at will. Enslaved peoples were bound to the households of their owners. While we know enslaved people in Schenectady could and were sold at the whim or economic convenience of a slave owner, we do not know how common this occurrence was. It's possible that the enslaved population of Schenectady was so stable because these people were generally kept in place here. It's also possible that this apparent stability on the pages is in fact just a rough equilibrium of people being trafficked in and out of the county. Suffice it to say, this question is perhaps not the point, because however we try to explain the stability of the county's black population during this period, it was certainly not a reflection of free choices made by free people. So it's very interesting indeed that as soon as black Schenectadians were free to leave the area, they did, in remarkable numbers as well. The census of 1830, conducted almost immediately after the formal end of slavery in New York, shows a dramatic 42% decrease in the county's black population, from 520 down to just 300. Such a shift should immediately grab our attention. We can see a brief and significant rebound in the population by 1840, but, in every census thereafter, the black population of the county would steadily shrink ending the century at only 165 people. We can look even closer. The census of 1900 tells us that 62 of the 165 black Schenectadians were born outside the state of New York and thus could not be natives to Schenectady in the first place. These newcomers were almost all from southern states and represent the vanguard of the well-studied Great Migration out of that area. But that leaves us with just 103 locally born black Schenectadians at the century's end, making for a local population decline of about 80%. Of course, this trend raises many questions. Our first question being, why? Why would black Schenectadians choose to uproot themselves and look for new homes elsewhere? This certainly couldn't have been an easy or convenient process. It must have been something they did for certain very good reasons. Of course, the only ones who could definitively answer this question would be the 19th century citizens themselves. But they are no longer here to answer that question, and since we don't have their words and sentiments preserved, we might just have to come up with some educated guesses on our own. And for that reason, we'll continue to look through our census data to see what else it can tell us. We should probably begin with the understanding that 19th century society was organized in explicit racial hierarchy. This shouldn't really be a controversial point, but sometimes it bears repeating. And even the end of slavery in New York does not mean the end of white supremacy in Schenectady, nor anywhere in this state. The attitudes that permitted slavery before 1827 would carry on in new ways afterwards. For instance, our state began its existence requiring all male citizens to own at least $250 in real estate if they wanted to vote. In 1821, this property requirement was removed for white men, but explicitly introduced for black men. This system of second-class citizenship persisted for about 50 years, and in fact, New York voters defeated several referenda that sought to remove the property requirement for black men. The impetus for black male suffrage would ultimately come not from New York voters, but from the federal level, with the passage of the 15th Amendment in 1870. With government documents being known for being rather dry and boring, you might not think that a racial hierarchy would manifest itself clearly on the pages of the 19th century census. And yet, it most certainly does. Let's take, for instance, the 1800 census data for Schenectady, then still a part of Albany County. Every free black head of house in the county is so identified with certain words appended to their name. Black men are denoted as, quote, a free Negro, while any black woman who held her own household is referred to, quote, a free wench. Now, the word wench might seem like a strangely disrespectful choice to use in an official federal document, but unfortunately, it simply illustrates a broader pattern in how white society referred to black women at this time. We can find similar uses of the word wench to refer to black women in the written record that we have here at our Grems Doolittle Library. 
This particular notation would be discontinued by 1810, but still, for the next 50 years, black New Yorkers would be tallied separately from their white neighbors. These separate columns for black residents had fewer age categories than their white neighbors, as though recording this information was deemed less important. The effect is to mark people of color as conspicuous and separate from white society. And as we know from history, it is rare indeed that people who are treated as separate are also treated as equals. Furthermore, we can see a similar pattern in our early directories for the city of Schenectady. Keep in mind that a directory is not meant to be a comprehensive record of a city's population like a census is. Instead, a directory is commissioned, usually by a private group, to provide its subscribers with handy and convenient information about notable figures in commerce and industry. Much like we see in the federal documents, in these records we still see the names of black Schenectadians deliberately identified with either italic text or the word colored listed afterwards in parentheses. Keep in mind this must not have been an incidental effort. A typesetter took the time and effort to physically swap out standard text for italic text or added extra letters to their print block specifically to alert the reader that the person behind the name was not white. They did this with intent. And should we go through one of these directories, we'll quickly notice a scarcity of black people listed in the first place. For instance, in our very first city directory, conducted in 1842, we find only 25 people listed in that conspicuous italic text. From our census data, we know the actual black population at the end of this decade was 380. And as we'll discuss later, this data also shows us 117 black Schenectadians employed in one way or another. And yet, only 25 of these were considered important enough to name in this directory. Clearly, Schenectady's black population was excluded from the normal social and economic circles. However, legal and social segregation alone might not be enough to explain our original query into Schenectady's black exodus. Schenectady, after all, was hardly unique in its segregated society. A black family leaving Schenectady would unfortunately only find identical conditions in every city across New York State and in every state across the nation. And these people would certainly be aware of this fact before they packed up their lives and moved. But the context of social inequality, apart from any explanatory power it has, is essential for understanding the next phase of our analysis. Regardless of the time period, one of the most important dimensions of any person's life is the work that they do. What labor do they perform? Why are they doing it? And how does that work meet their economic needs? If that work fails to meet their various needs, it is a human impulse to look for somewhere else where they might find better fortunes. These considerations are crucial in understanding the disappearance of Schenectady's black population in the 19th century. But to understand this, we must start at the very beginning. From 1661 to 1827, most black Schenectadians were enslaved and accordingly had no agency over their own labor. But what exactly did these people have to do? The 1820 census provides us with our best clues. In that decade, in all households in which black people lived, 196 worked in agriculture, 19 in commerce, and 39 worked in manufacturing. Now this data is tricky because this includes many households in which black as well as white people lived and worked. The census is not specific enough to clarify who did what. If we look at just free black households at this time, we find 48 engaged in agriculture, none in commerce, and just two in manufacturing. There are an additional four households headed by black women who are not listed in any sector of labor. How they supported themselves is a mystery. So while we may still have many questions, we can at least conclude that Schenectady's enslaved population entered the free labor market with a skill set primarily linked to agriculture. This would have significant consequences for their economic fortunes in the following decades. After all, farming requires land, 
In the early 19th century, Schenectady was no longer a frontier outpost, surrounded by vast acres available for patent or purchase. The choicest farmland had long been bought up and was controlled by an entrenched landowning class. Enslaved people were set free, often with just the clothes on their backs. With no land of their own to farm, and with no money to buy it, newly freed people would have little choice but to work on someone else's farm, perhaps even the same people who had enslaved them. And in fact, in the 1830 and 40 census, we still see many free black families living in white households, probably doing just that. It was certainly possible to save enough money in this way to eventually purchase farmland, but the data shows this was not a common outcome. In 1850, the census lists only two black men who farmed for themselves. The 1860 census lists seven, while the 1870 census again only lists two. Simon Murray of Glenville was one of these successful farmers. For black Schenectadians who were not so fortunate as Simon was, it is entirely conceivable that they might leave the county altogether, looking for a place where they might make a new start for themselves. The steep drop in the county's black population during the first years of freedom would suggest this is precisely what happened. But for those who remained, later 19th century census data paints a rather limiting picture of their economic opportunities. Beginning with the 1850 record, individuals are listed along with their specific occupations, giving us, finally, a clearer idea of what they actually did. You can see this data visualized here. Most of these black workers in 1850, that is to say 88 out of 113, are simply described as laborers. This is a frustratingly vague term. Laborers might work on a farm or in a warehouse, at a lumber mill, or in construction sites. We can generally understand these people as having no specialized skill or trade that was recognized by broader society. Being a laborer likely did not pay all that well. Indeed, only 10 of these laborers owned real estate, according to the census. It's hard to imagine this general labor would entice black Schenectadians to stay in the county when they could do much the same thing virtually anywhere else. This is not to say that none of the newly freed people were able to achieve success. Our historical society has long been aware of the prominent role in relative prosperity that many black barbers held in this city. Such men as John Wendell and Francis Thompson are listed in the 1870 as having a real estate valued at $2,000 and $3,000 respectively. For perspective, we can see similarly valued properties owned by grocers and blacksmiths. Richard P.G. Wright was wealthy enough to purchase a home at 84 Ferry Street amongst the established and old money homes of the stockade. If judged only by their land value, these men would be respectably middle class. Of course, these men were not likely only judged by their wealth. Through the rest of the century, there seems to be a shift in black labor patterns, but not one that represented rising fortunes. These graphs show the most common professions for all black laborers in Schenectady for each decade that data exists. As the years progress, more and more people are described as servants rather than laborers. This should not necessarily be seen as an upgrade. By the year 1900, servant was the predominant profession for black Schenectadians. Another trend worth noting can be found in the work of black women. The censuses of the mid-century only list occupations for men, while women are typically described as keeping house. And indeed, this does keep with broader gender norms of the period, that so long as a woman could remain at home, she should and would. In 1900, however, we see a large number of black women have entered the labor market, usually as housemaids or laundresses. It's doubtful they chose to do this because they found that line of work exciting or fulfilling. It would seem that two incomes were increasingly necessary for black households to pay their bills at this point. What we do see in census labor data tells us much, but what we don't see perhaps tells us even more. And it should be noted that throughout the data we have for the 19th century, there are no listings for black tradesmen other than barbers. For example, there are no blacksmiths, there are no coopers, there are no carpenters. Any job that might require specialized training or an apprenticeship seems to be conspicuously unavailable to black men. This, of course, is likely a consequence of the aforementioned racial attitudes of the day. It is hard to imagine how a black worker might break into a given industry if the master tradesmen or factory owners who control that industry saw them fit for only simple manual labor. <laughs> 
The bleak economic opportunities for 19th century Schenectadians of color were very much a product of the hostile and racist attitudes that they faced. Some families were able to persevere, save money, and acquire property to put down roots. However, these success stories stand out amidst a backdrop of bleak economic opportunities and outcomes. In our attempt to explain the exodus of Schenectady County's black population, surely one of our strongest explanations is that they sought better fortunes elsewhere. While 19th century Schenectady was divided along racial lines, census data shows us how, in certain cases, these lines could get blurred. When it comes to marriage between black and white residents, this almost never happened. Indeed, we can account for just a literal handful of such marriages or cohabitations over the entire period of our study. However, we can also see that Schenectady had a large number of people described as mulatto. For the purpose of this video, we'll simply be using that term as it is used in the census to describe people of both white and black or Native American parentage. The circumstances surrounding their birth would have been shrouded in secrecy, scandal, and likely some power dynamics we'd find deeply troubling. Suffice it to say, the black ancestry of a mixed-race person would do far more to determine their social standing than their white ancestry. As far as Schenectady's white society was concerned, black and mulatto people alike were invariably lumped into a catch-all category that they called colored. Of the 370 people of color listed in the 1850 census, 89 were mulatto. That's a very statistically significant 25%. Appearances and skin tones for these mixed-race Schenectadians could vary greatly. One of the most famous of Schenectady's so-called mulattoes was this man, James Hartley Switz, more commonly known as Big Jim Cuff. Much has been written about his life and career as a street peddler who sold herbs in the 19th century. Strangely, we've only encountered him once in the federal census, a listing in 1880, where he's given his racial designation M.U. for mulatto. Schenectady historian Larry Hart mentions that Jim's parentage was something of a controversy. Most people who knew Jim believed he was born to an enslaved black father and a Native American mother, or perhaps vice versa. No one really knew. For his part, Jim insisted that his mother was Native American, but his father was white. Since Jim was born before the popularization of birth certificates, there was likely never an official document that would clarify this issue, and it's not our purpose to settle this debate here and now. Instead, Jim provides us an example of someone whose birth was shrouded in mystery, and whose physical appearance is somewhat ambiguous. And while Jim never did this, many Schenectadians, like him, could attempt to pass themselves off as white. If you're not familiar with the phenomenon of passing, it's something you can see throughout American history, and really anywhere else where physical or so-called racial traits are used to distinguish between powerful groups and powerless groups. In passing, a person who technically belongs to the disempowered group, but who plausibly looks like they belong to the empowered group, claims the identity of that latter group. If their neighbors don't know any different and accept the assumed racial identity, the passing individual can also assume the privileges of that group, or at least spare themselves the discrimination that they knew before. Their children and grandchildren could then claim those privileges, making it an attractive prospect in a segregated society. Of course, not just any black or mulatto Schenectadian could even attempt to pass themselves off for white. This was not an easy escape from discrimination. If their skin tone was simply too dark, if they were well known in the community, passing for white would be impossible. However, in our census survey, we believe we've identified at least several instances of Schenectadians passing from one decade to the next. First we have Rebecca Van Vranken, a woman listed in the 1840 census as black. At that point, she's living in the first ward of the city. She's between 24 and 36 years old, the apparent head of the household, including an older black man, and a young black girl between 0 and 10 years old. Unfortunately, this is the only real information the census provides us. 
By 1850, however, there is no black woman who matches this description in Schenectady County. Instead, we see a woman named Rebecca Van Vranken living in the rural area of Niskiuna with her husband Nicholas and two daughters, aged 9 and 11. All the members of this household are apparently white. The ages for all involved match up almost perfectly for the passage of time, and the move from the city to the countryside may have allowed this family to adopt a new identity for themselves amongst new neighbors. A possible counterpoint is that there are actually several men named Nicholas Van Vranken living in Schenectady across these two decades. However, none of these other Nicholas Van Vrankens seem to have a household that matches the description of that black family that we see in 1840. We may never know for sure, but a plausible interpretation of the limited evidence we have suggests that Rebecca Van Vranken, at some point between 1840 and 1850, began to pass herself and her family off as white. Next, we find another candidate for passing, in a woman named Elizabeth Sparrow. Elizabeth first comes to our attention in the 1880 census. There we see her as a widowed 39-year-old dressmaker, living with her 18-year-old son, Davis. Both are listed as MU for mulatto, so their skin may have been quite light. Unfortunately, we have no data from the 1890 census, but we can catch up with one Elizabeth Sparrow in the 1900 census instead. This woman is 60 years old, exactly as old as the woman from 1880 would be after 20 years. She lives alone now, and apparently has no profession, as though she had retired. She is described as a widow, with one living child, just like the Elizabeth from 1880. Crucially, this woman is listed as white. We can also find a David Sparrow, listed separately, living with his wife of 16 years, named Susan. He is also listed as white. While his name is slightly different than the young man we saw in 1880, this could easily be explained as a typo. It would seem that at some point between 1880 and 1900, Elizabeth and Davis Sparrow were able to shed their mulatto label and adopt the label of whiteness. We've identified a few other instances of these possible passing scenarios, but I'd rather not belabor you with the individual details of each case, because ultimately we'll never know how many black Schenectadians, if any, tried to pass themselves off as white. An integral part of this process is keeping it a secret. A passing individual might even change their name to go along with their new identity, making it impossible to track them through census data. Furthermore, we may also never know how successful this was in practice. Did Rebecca and Elizabeth really change their social standing amongst their new neighbors? Or were they simply able to convince the census taker at the end of each decade? We can conclude this section not with certainty, but with the possibility that at least some small part of Black Schenectady was able to disappear from the record without actually physically leaving the county. Up to this point, we have tried to explain why Schenectady's Black population fell so dramatically and so steadily through the 1800s. However, we should also make some attempts to understand what Black Schenectady looked like during this century-long process. The census might not tell us the intimate or familiar details of any given household, but it can tell us where these households were, if only as a series of imprecise snapshots. These broad patterns might still help us better understand this community in flux. Let's begin with a county-wide look at the year 1820, which would mark the height of Schenectady's black population for that century. This map shows a breakdown of the various townships in Schenectady County, whose borders look much the same as they do today. We've overlaid the reported populations of each township and of the city itself. Of the 520 black people in the county, a comfortable majority of 313 live in the city but we can still see free and enslaved people living in each of the outlying rural towns. Rotterdam and Glenville have the most at 96 and 62, respectively. As the century progresses, however, we see these rural populations shrink 
leaving most of the remaining black population concentrated in the city. This data seems to support our earlier argument that the lack of access to farmland was a key driver of Schenectady's black diaspora. Now let's zoom in to just the city of Schenectady. This map from 1850 shows the concentration of black residents through each ward of the city. The data here shows a clear preponderance of black Schenectadians living in the third and fourth wards. At the time, these areas were the newly developing fringes and would be better accessible to a generation of people who had only recently gained their freedom. Their physical concentration on the margins of the city is perhaps a fitting metaphor for the social marginalization that they experienced. In the better established first ward, containing the 200-year-old stockade, and the second ward on the east side of the Erie Canal, we find noticeably fewer people of color. Going through the pages of the census, it's easy to notice how most black households and black individuals would be scattered and isolated across a predominantly white city. There might be one or two such families on a given street, or maybe even in a given ward of the city itself. However, beginning in 1820, we can identify at least one section of town that might plausibly be called the nucleus of the black community. This area is bounded by the Erie Canal to the west, Union College to the east, and Union Street to the south. Fonda Street, today known as Upper J Street, would serve as the backbone of this community. Not only does this area stand out for its high concentration of black residents, it is also notable because the people who lived here have a considerably higher rate of property ownership. Some of these homes are valued at thousands of dollars. We see the same family names living here decade after decade. Various branches of the Johnsons, the Thompsons, and the Wendells, for instance, made this place their home, and this likely contributed to a sense of community and stability. Unfortunately, we have no first-hand descriptions of this area, and few photos of it exist from the time period. And by 1880, this neighborhood had apparently dispersed, leaving about a dozen black individuals in the entire Third Ward. The proximity to the Erie Canal, the railroad, and the burgeoning Schenectady locomotive works made this area increasingly unattractive residential space, but increasingly valuable industrial space. And so, as the industrialization of this area commenced, the black Fonda Street residents disappear. At this point, we can only demonstrate a correlation, not a causation, between these phenomena. We don't know if the expanding industry pushed the black residents out, or if the residents left for unrelated reasons and the factories simply filled the space that they vacated. Perhaps the truth lies somewhere in the middle. But since then, nearly a century of intense industrial usage has erased virtually any physical evidence of this black neighborhood. In 1908, the railroad tracks were raised up from ground level, effectively cutting this area in half. Walking through it today, one can only imagine what life was like for the black Schenectadians who made this their home 150 years ago. While federal census data can only provide a surface level description of a given population, it does provide us with valuable insights into the otherwise invisible black population of 19th century Schenectady. Over this period, the black population shrunk in absolute numbers, even as the overall population of the county ballooned. You can see this trend quite clearly in the graph here. New immigrants, overwhelmingly from Europe, would reshape the physical and demographic landscape of the area. What black Schenectadians remained would certainly be hard to spot in this changing scene. In 1800, black Schenectadians made up a perfectly visible, although legally oppressed, 6% of the county population. By 1900, they comprised an easily overlooked 0.3%. That's only three people for every 1,000. Whether you're a professional historian or an amateur reflecting on your own life experiences, it's always tempting to look at the past through rose-tinted glasses. And the disappearance of black Schenectadians over the 19th century might offer a convenient excuse to not examine the racist paradigms that facilitated that disappearance.
But the data we've uncovered here makes for a compelling case that long after the abolition of slavery in New York, a racial hierarchy persisted that rendered black Schenectadians second-class citizens in their own hometown. There were limited economic opportunities for adults and limited futures for their children. We honestly shouldn't be surprised if so many of them sought to better their fortunes by moving somewhere else. I'd like to leave things with a strange and unpleasant little document that we have in our collection. It dates to 1906, just after the period that we are studying. Uh, this is a playbook for a local minstrel show put on by volunteer men and women from Schenectady. Like all minstrel shows, these performers would don blackface makeup and enact skits and songs whose humor derived entirely from racist caricatures of black people. This particular playbook is for the sixth annual iteration of this performance, and so it was apparently quite the popular act. This time period is commonly associated with the beginning of Schenectady's golden era. Indeed, the early 20th century represents a fascinating chapter in our county's history, with many noble and inspiring stories to share. But as this document would showcase, this period has a less inspiring side to it as well, one emerging directly from the previous century of black marginalization. We hope to use our work here not as a standalone project, but as a basis for future research into how the issue of race continued to play a significant role in our city's history. If you feel like you'd like to contribute to or participate in this conversation, don't be afraid to reach out to us. After all, we are a community organization, and we can only learn if we learn together. <laughs>